WCBI News at 6 starts now. Good evening, everyone. An Amory family, or excuse me, some Amory residents are uprooted after a tree topples onto their home. No one was injured, but they do now need a new place to stay. Our Jory Talley joins us live in the studio with more. The Wednesday night storm comes after days of flash flooding and river flooding across Monroe County. The combination of saturated ground and high winds proved to be a fatal combination for some trees, and one of those trees was too much for this home. We thought it was a tornado without, you know, the siren going on. That's what it felt like, but, uh, I mean, it just sounded like the house was tearing down. This uprooted tree is what was tearing down the home on 10th Avenue North. We was sitting there watching TV, you know, just got back from the gym, and uh, next thing I know, it just starts hailing and thunderstorming, and then the wind just started blowing. Next thing I know, the house starts shaking, so we was standing the, between the kitchen and, and the living room. And we go to the hallway, and the house starts shaking some more, so we hop off in the closet. Moments before seeking shelter, Corey Long was standing inches away from where the tree now lays. Long and his roommate, along with a friend and his family, were all inside when the outside came in. It was just like a split second. I really, I really didn't hear it too well because, uh, you know, I was hearing more screaming from everybody than anything. But, uh, yeah, I really didn't hear much, but you could hear the... House breaking down, that's about it. March would have marked one year since Long moved into the home. Now he's left having to move everything out. Right now we have flash flooding, we have river flooding, and then last night just a pop up storm came through and the ground was so wet it's knocked trees over and just so happened it knocked the tree over on this house. Long is one of many across Monroe County who has been uprooted by the recent storms. Yesterday afternoon I finished up all my damage reports from the flooding and I had turned in 22 homes that were either major or destroyed and I submitted it that I was through and now this I find out this so I will go back and submit another one and say I wasn't through. Long says he's going to stay with family until he goes on active duty. He's not sure about his roommate's plans. There are about 100 tornado damaged homes that cannot take electricity. Columbus Light and Water employees and city leaders went to those homes today. They handed out flyers to the people that live there and explained the situation while giving information about resources that are available. Shady and Mall Streets along with Conway Drive are particularly hard hit. If electricity was hooked up to some of these homes, it could cause a fire. A large problem where the house is the roof's off, the walls are gone, foundations cracked. And we've seen smaller problems where just limbs and debris have torn the weatherhead loose from the house. So you've got both big and small problems. The city inspection department will approve repairs to the homes before electricity can be connected. If you believe that you should be receiving power and or not, call Columbus Light and Water's emergency line at the number on your screen. Rivers and creeks are returning to their banks, but they've left behind waterlogged homes and water-weary homeowners. Our Riley Livingston gets an up-close look at what it takes to get things back to normal. She joins us in the studio. Joey, today I had a chance to talk with some professional cleaners as they worked on one of those waterlogged homes. They are helping homeowners dry out and clean up their homes and gave me a few tips. The first thing they do when cleaning a home hit by floodwaters is remove anything that can absorb water. That includes carpet, drywall, and even wooden cabinets. The next step is to sanitize with an antimicrobial to prevent growth of mold. After that, they bring in dehumidifiers to dry out the home before starting to rebuild. Abby Thompson's team also wears PPE suits, gloves, and masks so they don't come in contact with any contaminated material. It's extremely important for two reasons. One, because flood water is contaminated, so you don't want to have any contaminants inside of your home. But then the other reason is because of mold growth. Um, if it isn't dried out properly, um, you can certainly have mold issues, which is hard to, um, to get rid of once you have it. Thompson says if your home was built before 1978, you need to be even more careful. It could contain lead paint and asbestos. If you find out your home does have asbestos, you need to call in a professional. 
The Disaster Assistance Center continues to encourage people to sign up for help. Anyone that received any type of damage from the tornado or flood should go to the center. City leaders say county residents impacted by flooding should go to the lower level of the trotter also and sign up. Emergency management is trying to get an accurate number of people impacted by the severe weather. People who have insurance should also go to the trotter. The center is open from 8 to 6 Monday through Friday and 9 to 3 on Saturday. Disasters like Saturday's twister and recent flooding highlight the importance of having a sufficient supply of blood on hand. WCBI is helping out by hosting a community-wide blood drive. The blood mobile will be set up at the WCBI studios at 201 Fifth Street South in Columbus from 1 until 6 Friday. There's an urgent need for all blood types, but supplies of type O are critically low. Go to WCBI.com for more information or to make an appointment. As Black History Month comes to a close, we conclude our Made by History series where we started, the church. After Saturday's destructive tornado in Columbus, there were church groups on the ground within hours to help. One was Missionary Union Baptist Church, a historic African-American church near one of the hard-hit neighborhoods. Our Quentin Smith has more on their efforts and joins us live from the studio. Quentin? Yeah, Joey, when we talked with Pastor Tony Montgomery earlier this month about the role the church plays in the African-American community, he had no idea that in just a few weeks he put those words into action. If a movement is going to start, it has been in the church. The church has been the power base for our community. It was just a few weeks ago when Pastor Tony Montgomery explained how people find hope in the church, not knowing that hope would now be relied upon after an EF3 tornado struck the city of Columbus this past weekend. The church is a place of resource. Um, yes, we can pray for people, but when you talk about meeting needs, it should be meeting the spiritual and the physical needs of people. Um, so it's not just about, you know, give them a scripture. Um, it's give them some food, uh, provide shelter. Instead of serving people from the pulpit on Sunday, Montgomery and his church were out in the community serving those who were impacted by the tornado. We, we did have a brief worship service on Sunday morning, but my cook was cooking the whole time and servers were getting things ready, so at 12 o'clock noon, we were ready to feed. The church has fed close to a thousand people this week alone. The longtime pastor says, in dark times like these, the church serves as a beacon of light, rallying the community together and encouraging everyone to keep their faith in the midst of the storm. For us, it's to make sure that this community is made whole again. Um, yes, uh, this community may not have the resources of some other communities, um, and, but they are people, they're God's people. And we want to make sure that, you know, the city, FEMA, MEMA, the governor, they do what they are supposed to do. All week long, other pastors and churches have also answered the call to service by giving back to a community that's lost so much, showing that not even a destructive tornado or demolished homes or damaged community can stop them from doing the Lord's work. This is our community. We, we serve here, we work here, uh, we worship here, and we wanted to do it for this community to let them know that we're not just somebody who invites them to church, but somebody who serves them when they have needs. They're not victims. They are survivors. But if we don't do what we're supposed to do, we'll make them victims. And that's the problem. Uh, the church's position in this is to do the work of God, but to be the voice, if we have to, of people who are hurting. Now Montgomery says his church will continue to serve meals and keep their boots on the ground, assisting everyone impacted by the storm. Joey? All right, thanks, Quentin, for that great story. Time now to turn things over to Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson with a first, or rather Jacob Dickey with a uh, look at our forecast.
Hey, Joey, not many people can get my name right tonight. That's all right. Uh, we got a cloudy sky for many of us out there right now in the area, seeing a little bit of sunshine earlier. That felt nice. Most of the heavy rain and storms is off to our south here. And I do think that we have the chance to see a few little showers, maybe a rumble of thunder as we go into the overnight hours. If that happens, it'll be south and east of Columbus. Many of us, though, staying mostly cloudy and dry. Tonight, temperatures are heading for the 40s, a few isolated showers and mostly cloudy. Coming up, we'll talk about the chance for rain continuing through the weekend, as well as some strong storms on the way. Those in just a bit. The search continues for a missing Monroe County man. 54-year-old Stephen Hubner was last seen Monday morning when he told his wife he was leaving for a business trip to Montgomery, Alabama. Hubner, a civilian employee at the Columbus Air Force Base, never showed up for that meeting. Sheriff Cecil Cantrell tells us Hubner's co-workers say it's out of character for him to be late for an appointment or to not check in. His cars are at home. His telephone is at home. Uh, just a lot of a lot of things that are just not adding up at this point. We hope he's okay. We hope he, we hear from him. Uh, but we are very concerned. It's Monroe County Sheriff's Department. We all we did an investigation down there in the neighborhood. Talked to all the neighbors. And yesterday didn't see anything out of the out of the ordinary. Anyone with information should call the Monroe County Sheriff's Department. Area residents are learning how to balance profit and preservation. We find out what it could mean for one town when we come back. Welcome back. Preserving and protecting historic properties while encouraging economic development and growth was on the agenda in Aberdeen. As WCBI's Allie Martin reports, the State Department of Archives and History is helping locals better understand historic preservation. Whether it's City Hall, the Downtown Business District, or Antebellum Homes, Aberdeen is known for its abundance of historic buildings. Section 2 is just definitions um, about what a historic resource is. And preserving the landmarks is the goal of Aberdeen's Historic Preservation Commission. That commission decides what changes, if any, can be made to the exteriors of buildings within designated historic districts. The commission asked the Mississippi Department of Archives and History to hold a public forum to explain to folks what historic preservation means. It's one of the great things that we get to do is to help people understand why their historic resources are important and how they can better preserve them. What steps they can take that won't um, be debilitating to a historic property. It doesn't have to be cost prohibitive. Sometimes um, trying to do the right thing is, is actually more um, economical than tearing out windows or replacing doors. Um, so we're just helping people to educate people and to help them understand the process and the commitment that the city of Aberdeen's made to historic preservation. The goal is not to discourage economic development, but instead make sure everyone is on the same page when it comes to preserving and protecting historic properties. We are hoping that uh, people will know who to talk to and also that the aldermen will understand better our role uh, as involved with the city government uh, and with the building inspector. So it, uh, we're hoping that everybody will just have a better understanding of how all this interacts. Seymour says preserving historic buildings can help drive development. That's why she says it's important for everyone to work together. In Aberdeen, Ali Martin, WCBI News. There are also grants and tax credits available for investment, remodeling, and renovation on some historic buildings. Well, our next risk for some strong storms looks to be coming into this weekend. I'm eyeballing Saturday night through the day on Sunday. We have a slight risk of severe storms. I've got the full details on that coming up after the break. Your WCBI First Alert AccuWeather Forecast with meteorologist Jacob Dickey. Things are looking not too bad out there right now. We've got temperatures in Columbus at 64. The light north winds at 3 miles an hour, helping to show that boundary trying to push on through, but still struggling as we go here through the evening. Temperatures across the area are in the 60s to the south of that boundary. The northern areas are even cooler. It's 52 right now in Corinth, down to 48 in Oxford, just down the road in Calhoun City. It's at 58. Get down here to Starkville, 64, 67 down US 45 from Columbus down towards the cap. Radar is dry right now. Had a few little spot showers pop up there in Pickens County. Those are pushing off to the east. We're dry for a couple of more hours, but we are watching the big batch of showers and storms off to our south and our west. Some of those may make it into some of our area overnight tonight and bring us a chance for a few isolated showers 
Overall, though, I think tonight trending drier. Temperatures look to be falling into the 40s for many of us by the morning. I've got 45 here in Columbus, 41 in Amory, 48 in Macon, a little cooler in Tupelo, 39 there, 36 in Corinth, and 35 in Ripley, under a mostly cloudy to partly cloudy sky. On Friday, then, we'll see a mix of sun and clouds through the day. The good news, yes, some sunshine, I think, sneaks on in. Temperatures look to be heading for the upper 50s for many of us, with northwest winds between uh, 0 and 5 miles an hour, we'll say. Here's the temperature highs, 57 in Columbus, 56 in West Point, a bit cooler than today, but a little closer to seasonal. We'll get to 60 in Aliceville and 59 in Macon, Tupelo at 56. Here's some of those showers trying to make it into our area overnight tonight here. It looks like it'll be from uh, Highway 25 south and east that has the best chance to see a few of those spot showers in the area. The heavier rain looks to stay south of 2059. On the day Friday, then, we've got some sunshine mixing on in, but by Saturday night, storms move back on in here, starting to see the future cast pick up a little bit on uh, some heavier activity. Could see some good rain here, one to two inches through Monday across the area. I don't think that's going to affect flooding too much. Uh, maybe some localized spots, but the river levels, I think, are going to be okay from this event here. As we look to Saturday night, then, this low pressure winding up in Arkansas, that's a classic sign for maybe some more stronger storms into the weekend. Saturday night through Sunday, we'll say afternoon or so before that cold front is able to clear on through. And there still is a bit of uncertainty with things right now. We still think that there will be some strong storms somewhere across the southeast. Storm Prediction Center has a broad slight risk. That's a level two out of five, including our area. And again, we're watching Saturday night, let's say about 10 o'clock all the way through Sunday afternoon and evening. The question is going to be, where does this boundary end up here? If that boundary lifts more to the north, that puts us in a bit more of a threat. If it stays to the south, then uh, we'll be a little quieter as far as things go. Big story, though, is cold air is coming by Monday. Temperatures taking a tumble. We're going to be in the 60s on Sunday. By Monday morning, temperatures will be in the 20s. The wind chills in the teens. Ole Miss feeling the sting of defeat, a rocky finish against Tennessee has the Rebels down but not out. More from Kermit Davis and company next in sports. WCDI Sports with Tom Ebel is brought to you by your local Ford dealers. Go further. Oxford was heartbreak city in the USA last night. The Rebels losing a last second ball game to seventh ranked Tennessee. Whether it was a missed free throw or a Grant Williams bucket with four seconds left, a perceived missed call, a block, or a charge, Kermit Davis said it was a heartbroken locker room, but the Rebels aren't losing any confidence. Still in a four way tie for the double bye in the SEC tournament, Davis says his team proved why it has a shot to go to the big dance in March. A lot of times people start looking at the eye test this time of year and watching college teams. And those teams look like NCAA tournament teams. And I thought tonight we did. And, uh, but do we have work to do? You bet we've got, everybody's got work to do. You know, a big game uh, on Arkansas on Saturday. But I, I want our guys to feel and act and carry themselves like we are an NCAA tournament team. From day one, like I said, we was talking about, you know, this is not going to be a rebuild of years. NCAA tournament team. We looked at ourselves as a re NCAA, double NCAA team, and uh, you know tonight I, I feel like we played like one. Taking a look at the absolute mess that is the SEC men's basketball standings, excluding the top three, that's LSU, Tennessee, and Kentucky, who are all 13 and two and tied for first in the conference. A four-way tie for fourth place: Mississippi State. Ole Miss, Florida, and South Carolina all tied with a 9-6 and six conference record. Then you have Alabama and Auburn a game back at 8-7. and seven. Six teams within one game of a double bye in the SEC tournament in two weeks. So for Mississippi State and Ole Miss, what does that mean for the final three games of the season? For the Bulldogs, the remaining three on the schedule, on the road at Auburn Saturday. That's a big game as we just saw, one game back and then on the road. Mississippi State getting a crack at Tennessee next week and then wrapping up the regular season against Texas A&M. And for Ole Miss at Arkansas on Saturday, the Rebels will hope to avoid a letdown after last night's loss. Then another huge home game for the Rebels. Number four, Kentucky coming to town next Tuesday. So another top 10 opportunity for Ole Miss to add to that NCAA tournament resume. And then the Rebels wrapping up the season with Missouri. All must-win games as the season comes to a close. 
And you never know, even some of those teams that are 5-8 and eight in the conference could go on a crazy run and make things interesting come Nashville for the SEC tournament. But switching gears, senior night inside the hump in Starkville, Mississippi State taking on LSU with a lot on the line. With a win, the Bulldogs would clinch a share of its second straight SEC regular season championship. Vic Schaefer says now is the time for good teams to lock in and get hot. And thinking of his seniors, the Bulldogs head coach appreciates the work they've put in. They've done this every year they've been here. Played into late March, their freshman year, and then April, their sophomore and junior years. We're the only sport on campus that starts the first day of school with conditioning and weights. And if we're doing our job, you're doing it all the way to April. Only sport. And no spring break, no fall break, no Thanksgiving, no Christmas. It, it is it's so draining on your student athletes. And again, that's why this time of year, a lot of teams will fall by the wayside because they can't do it. They're just not tough enough. That's it for sports. Last look your weather is next. Well, we'll see a few spot showers really over the next 48 hours, if you can say that. By Saturday night, though, some showers and thunderstorms expected to pick up through the day on Sunday. Some of those, again, could be on the stronger side. We're watching that cold front. Cold, though, next week. You ready for those teens by Monday morning? Um, not yeah. really, but <laughs> might as well be, right? That's right. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for joining us.